Roll VTR. Quiet on the floor, ready to dissolve to camera one. And dissolve. Stand by to key in the titles, ready with camera two on the titles. And dissolve to the first title. Ready to change first title. And change it. Ready to change title two. Change it. Ready to change title three and change it. Okay, we're gonna lose title four. That'll free you two to go to talent. And it's lost, you're free to go to talent. Stand by to cue Don and cue him. A five-year-old boy caught a mouse in a trap and he wanted his one-year-old brother to know of this great accomplishment. But you can't tell him about it, said his mother. He's too young, he wouldn't understand. You don't have to tell him about it, said the boy. Just show it to him. Television is a visual medium, a medium of showing, not telling. If I were to merely tell you, for example, about the hazards of smoking, it would be a lot less persuasive than simply to show you an actual human lung from the body of a man who never smoked and another lung from the body of one who did. That's the primary objective of using visual materials on television to help present your ideas more effectively. A secondary objective is showmanship. And no matter how humble or sophisticated your facilities are, a little pictorial imagination can make all the difference between an amateur and a professional television production. But before choosing any visual, there are certain characteristics of this medium which must be considered. The first is the aspect ratio of the television screen, three units high by four units wide. And this horizontal three by four ratio is unchanging and uncompromising, and everything we bring to the screen should conform to it. Vertically photographed slides, for example, are a lot less useful than horizontal ones, which fill the entire three by four frame with their compositions. If a vertical visual must be used, then try to move inside it, recomposing it to suit the medium or pull back and add something to it for pictorial balance. All it takes sometimes to turn a poorly composed television picture into an artistic one is the moving of a camera or the addition of a prop. But the results are well worth the extra effort. Another characteristic of television which should affect everything we put onto it is the size of the receiver. Compared to the widescreen motion picture, it's a relatively tiny viewing area. It's also a very personal, intimate, close-up way of communicating on a one-to-one -one basis with individuals, alone or in groups. And these characteristics determine not only the kind of programming we present, but the way in which it's presented. Even the size and location of your audience is important. A single viewer, half a dozen feet away from his screen, would have little trouble reading my name, but if I wanted to reach the back row of a classroom, this same visual would have to be doubled, even tripled in size. Small detail just can't be seen on television, especially at a distance. So your most valuable shot is the close-up. And when even that becomes hard to see, a simpler, bolder visual should be made, one that eliminates all but the most essential information. Busy pictures only distract. Viewers are especially frustrated by words they can't read. Bold, simple words are better than decorative ones. And with the range of do-it-yourself materials on the market, like these press-on alphabets, almost anyone can do a professional lettering job Here's another important tool of the television graphic artist, a framing guide that reminds him not only to conform to the natural horizontal ratio of the screen, but to leave lots of space around the edges of his card. Even professional cameramen sometimes draw a framing area on their viewfinders because they know that from one-sixth to one-tenth of the border area around their picture will be lost or cropped out by the time it reaches the viewer. So they compensate by shooting a little more than they need. 
The amount of cropping area will vary in every television operation, but it's always wise to keep the important part of your visual message within this safe center area of the 3x4 frame. Then make the message itself as clear and as bold as you can, with lots of contrast between the dark and light areas of your picture. Remember the size of the screen and the distance of your audience. Remember also that the monochrome television system is incapable of clearly reproducing all but the most distinct shades of gray. Anything in between will be lost in transmission. And a flat, washed-out picture will appear even flatter on a poorly adjusted set. On the other hand, too much contrast is equally irritating to both the eye and the equipment. A white, thin-lined cartoon drawing on a black chalkboard isn't too bad, but a large, massive white in a predominantly dark setting can dominate and distort the entire picture. That's why professional television performers never wear white shirts and why graphic artists never paint white on black, except when they want to key in or superimpose one image over another. The mid-tone ranges of the grayscale always reproduce best. Besides, on the monochrome system, a pastel color, like this yellow, looks as white as white, and a darker shade, like the green of the planter, could be black. There's still lots of contrast between them, but not enough to distort the picture. And there are some shades of cardboard, like this pastel green, which provide a good background for both black and white. But choose your colors carefully. Certain combinations which may look good to the eye might have little or no contrast on the air. One of these paints, for example, is a brilliant turquoise. The other is emerald green. On camera, they're both dark gray. It's more pleasing for people to work in an atmosphere of color, but make sure that the colors are compatible in shades of gray. Sometimes you can judge the contrast in a picture just by squinting at it, thus eliminating all but the most vivid darks and lights. But if you're not sure, put it on camera. As a matter of fact, if you use a lot of the same colors for visuals and background sets, put them together on a chart with their corresponding shades of gray. And when you're buying cardboard, paint, or furniture, buy it in the dull finish, because most television cameras are as sensitive to brightness and glare as they are to white. It's also very distracting for the viewer to have to watch a sparkling brooch, a shimmering photograph, or a shiny forehead. The brooch can be removed. The glossy photo can be tilted, or covered with a removable dulling spray, or better still, printed again in a dull matte finish. As for the head, it can be powdered. And when you're in the drugstore, pick up a tube of makeup to cover five o'clock shadow. You may even want to invest in an off-white handkerchief for guests who arrive wearing white. These then are the uncompromising characteristics of the medium, its size, its ratio, and its inability to transmit a wide range of contrast and detail. And once you begin to think in these terms, the rest is easy, because with a little imagination and adaptability, almost any flat, dimensional, or projected visual can be effectively used on television. Pre-cut cardboard, pastel colored, in an 11 by 14 or 14 by 17 size, makes a good solid backing for painted illustrations, press on letters, or cut out pictures. A piece of cheap black construction paper turns into a chalkboard on television. This grooved rubber material holds plastic lettering for last minute titles and superimposures and an ordinary record player can be converted into a platform for a piece of Eskimo art. On television, toy soldiers can wage tabletop war, while toy cars demonstrate the right of way. Here's a title that introduced a show about jigsaw puzzles. And here's one that closed a program on driving. Television graphics can be as simple or as elaborate as you want to make them. And remember that the last impression of a show is as important as the first. Television art is also the art of scrounging. Torn sheets from discarded wallpaper books make excellent backgrounds for credits. And the ends of rolls make good backdrops in a set. So do old egg cartons. 
and the packing materials from a newly acquired piece of equipment. Hunks of styrofoam can be cut up into letters, painted with a flat latex, and stuck onto a wall with double-sided tape to spell out the name of a program or to form the map of a city. And these painted over cardboard pillars used to be molds for pouring concrete. Add a little light and the background setting becomes even more interesting, but not so interesting that it distracts the viewer from the main ingredient of the show. Don't neglect your foreground either. Placing an appropriate prop or visual close to the camera adds new dimension and interest to a picture. Mirrors are handy too, for the shooting of high overhead angles that are impossible to reach with a studio camera. Even simple animation can be achieved in a studio by constructing a cardboard flow of water or painting the history of a cavity onto plastic overlays and dropping them into a tooth. Remember that a picture is always less interesting than the real thing and a moving picture more dramatic than a still. On the other hand, don't underrate the power of a simple photograph. Entire documentaries have been built on nothing more than a well-composed series of flat, simple visuals. As for the transparencies, motion picture films, slides, film strips, and overheads, with a little imagination they can all be used on television, even if you have a one camera, one VTR operation. Several projectors at once, for example, can throw their light onto a single frame, and while their images are mixed and married together by a projectionist, a TV camera records the marriage from directly beside the projectors or on the other side of a translucent screen, like an old shower curtain stretched on a frame. When a program begins, its title can be superimposed on the same camera. And when it ends, the picture fades to black. Finally, don't forget that the cameraman himself has his own bag of visual tricks that can make a program come alive. They're called the long shot, the dolly, the pan, the tilt, the truck, the zoom, and the close-up. Especially the close-up. And there's one more visual I haven't mentioned yet, but if you choose it wisely, it can be the most powerful and persuasive of them all. It's called the talking face. Whatever picture you choose, Make it interesting, relevant, and easy to understand. And if it ever comes to a choice between telling and showing, show it to them. Fade the lights. Ready to bring in effects. Stand by to fade to black. And fade to black. 